the Druid Revival, inspired by the ancient Gaelic peoples whose priestly class were known as Druids or Drude. They may have also been artists, bards, judges, and healers. They gathered in sacred groves of oak and cherished the mistletoe from its branches. They sacrificed precious objects to bogs or holy wells, such, such as bent swords, wooden votives, and golden bowls. It began to be suppressed and pushed out of Gaul by the Roman Empire and became almost entirely lost. But on November 28, 1781, a man named Henry Hurl founded the ancient order of Druids at the King's Arm Tavern on Poland Street in London. Many members were devo devout Christians using Druidic symbology such as robes, oak, ivy, and wreaths. The King's Arm Tavern came to be the first ancient order of Druids Lodge. Lodge number two came in 1783 at the Rose Tavern. Soon after, a third was opened in Westminster. Soon they spread all across southern England. In 1792, on London's Primrose Hill, Yalo Morganag, a.k.a. Edward Williams, a Welsh stonemason and poet, held a gathering for bars and druids. Beginning in 1789, Yalo forged several documents that greatly impacted the neo-druid movement. He claimed to have manuscripts prove, which proved that Druidism and the Bardic tradition had continued unmolested in Glamorgan since the days before the Romans through the introduction of Christianity and into the modern era. He was wrong. Morganig had the fear that the Welsh were losing their heritage and traditions and so f felt he had to preserve and reintroduce them into the public. Unfortunately, some of it, this task involved forging documents and creating traditions. Historian Gwyn A. Williams crystallized Yalo's complex motives by claiming that he was driven by a Welsh resentment against arrogant English, a South Wales resentment against arrogant Northerners, a Glamorgan resentment against the rest, and a Yalo resentment against anyone who snubbed him. It is said on a midsummer's evening he took stone pebbles out of his pocket and made a small stone circle and performed a ceremony that he claimed was ancient. In 1794, however, the French Revolution began and the English government became suspicious of secretive societies and fraternities, which resulted in many lodges closing, and by the start of the 19th century, 32 lodges persisted. But at the Ivy Bush Inn located in Carmarthen, a town in Wales, the first appearance of a group called the Gorset Bards gathered for the East Fod a festival of Welsh culture dating back to 1176. For the festival, the bards performed and adopted Yalo's ceremony. Thus, the modern cultural druid was born. The first ever Gorsed was held on a Midsummer's Day, June 21, 1792, on Primrose Hill, London. A second Gorsed was held on September 22nd, and the Morning Chronicle presented an excellent report on the ceremony. Saturday, September 2nd, being the day on which the autumnal equinox occurred, and consequently in the phrase of barber, barterism, a solemn bardic day. Some Welch bards, resident in London, assembled in Congress on Primrose Hill, according to ancient usage, which required that it should be in the eye of the public observation, in open air, in a conspicuous space, and whilst the sun is above the horizon. The wanted ceremonies were observed, and a stone circle was formed, in the middle of which was the main gorsid, or altar, on which a naked sword being placed, all the bards assisted to sheathe it. On this occasion, the bards appeared in the insignia of their various orders. The bards' members were made up of poets, writers, musicians, artists, and individuals who have made a significant and distinguished contribution to Welsh language, literature, and culture and its members known as druids. The color of their costumes is indicative of their various ranks. White for druids, blue for bards, and green for ovates. By the beginning of the 1830s, the number of lodges rose to 139, with 200,000 members. However, division was rising in the order. Ever since its inception, its members had come from a variety of different societal backgrounds and many of the poorer members, particularly in the newer industrial towns in English Midlands, wanted it to act more like the beneficent clubs and friendly societies, which resulted in the United Provisional Committee, 
which gave the Arc Druids of each lodge to have a voice in the movement. In retaliation, the Grand Lodge expelled those lodges. And in 1833, half of the AOD left the order and created the UAOD. This became known as the Great Succession by Members. The United Ancient Order of Druids was more democratic and socially conscious than the AOD, being run by an elected board of directors and aiming for social intellectual intercourse and general philanthropy and benevolence. By 1846, the United Ancient Order of Druids had 330 lodges in England and Wales, as well as overseas. The AOD was growing significantly as well. According to Robert Hutton, an expert on early modern Britain, British folklore, pre-Christian religion, and contemporary paganism, saying, both halves of the former ancient order were therefore poised to make a significant contribution to Victorian culture, the more so in that by this time they were not alone among British voluntary societies in having the identity of Druid. Moving on to the next phase of this story is the return of the mystics. George Watson McGregor Reed, the eccentric who brought on a new wave of Druid, a more esoteric and nature-centric order that began as the Church of the Universal Bond in 1912. He drew inspiration from a mix of esoteric Christianity, Kabbalah, Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and mystical Islam. It was also still associated with Druids at this time. The group also began to produce the magazine The New Life, a magazine devoted to the spiritual illumination of all mankind. Few are known to remain to this day, but the ones that do have a very political theme to them, particularly the oppression of Islamic peoples in the Balkans and North Africa. The magazines were greatly influenced by its editor, Charles Rocher, a former Golden Dawn member and an artist. He had worked for the reforming Sultan of Morocco before he had been disposed of in 1908. Disgusted by the French takeover in 1912, Charles wrote an article about the genocidal war the Italians were waging against the Senussi in what is now Libya, called the Red Oasis, a record of the massacres perpetuated in Tripoli by the Italian army. Charles concluded that there is no such thing as Christian civilization. I believe that Christianity and modern civilization are opposed and irreconcilable. This gained McGregor's sympathy, and he supported Charles to further his journalism on the topic. Once McGregor captioned a photo of a small desert township saying, This sacred desert home, Libyan headquarters of the universal bond or unity, within whose walls were said to lie the bones of 20 members of the universal bond. At this point, the group was becoming more inspired by Islam, and at this time, Charles likely introduced McGregor to the followers of the Bob. But in the end, McGregor chose Druidism. At this point, Druidism and Celtism were considered a liberation theology for those unsatisfied by mainstream viewpoints and beliefs. McGregor Reed may have also considered Druidical wisdom to be his birthright. It certainly fit his form of universalism, since it was seen as the ancient universal religion. The significance of the great Bob movement, McGregor Reed claimed, lay in the fact that it was the living succession of the ancient Druid faith. These universalists, the ancient Druids, the Buddhists of another age, had left their mark upon the land in, in the form of their ancient monuments, and thus it was that the round towers of Ireland and Scotland, the cromlechs, the burrows, the silent stones of the ancient faith, in many parts are again brought to our attention of these, Stonehenge was the greatest, and for the midsummer solstice in 1912, McGregor Reed took the universal bond to the stones to celebrate. Stonehenge had been linked with Druidism in the public ever since the ancient order of Druids had held a major ceremony at the stones in August of 1905. This well-established friendly society was at its peak then, and its leaders were fascinated by the forms of Druidic mythology. Between 650 and 700 brothers turned up, complete with white robes, sickles, and Father Christmas beards. A druid without his beard is like a peacock without his tail, as one observer put it. 
Another observer of the Stonehenge solstice of 1907 commented on a current trend amongst solstice visitors. To greet the rising sun in garments of daring design and of a pattern which would in all likelihood strike terror into the shades of the original druidic worthies they, were, they are supposed to impersonate. The 1912 service had angered Sir Edmund Antrobus, the landlord. Antrobus was a notoriously quick-tempered. When he inherited Stonehenge from his father in 1901, he tried to blackmail the government into buying it for a huge sum. The government refused, so Antrobus enclosed the monument and began to charge for admission. A combined effort of local and national amenity groups tried to challenge his right to do so in the high court, but lost, on the grounds that a landowner had every right to exclude the pub public from his private property. On the day before the 1913 solstice, McGregor, now in the guise of Dashter Tautha di Danan, Dashter meaning high priest from the Parsi Zoroastrians, and Tautha di Danan from Irish mythology, was informed that no political or religious meetings would be tolerated by the state-recognized possessor, Sir Edmund Antrobus. Speaking as the direct su successor of the chief druids who have been, McGregor Reed announced his intention to return the next day and hold the service anyways. He did so, and the caretaker, backed by several pro policemen, refused to let him in unless he promised to abide by Antrobus's rule. This he absolutely refused to do, but he bought his tickets and more or less forced his way through. The service was held, and afterwards he addressed a sympathetic audience, a gathering of it, a composite character. And it was pleasing to see the military element predominating. The soldiers lay upon the mossy embankment, looking towards Dr. Tutha, as he told the story of our druid sires. Truly, it was an inspiring meeting, and the spirit guardians of the sacred circle rejoiced as the words of the message were wafted outwards from the gathering. Back at the gate, he brought down the kera on the landlord's head. In grief and sorrow, I call down the curse of Almighty God and of his spirit messengers, that the weak may be liberated from the molestation of the tyrannical response is sure. Kara, at the time, was thought of as a druid curse. The next year, ten universalists made the solstice pilgrimage in 1914, when Zoroastrianism was becoming increasingly popular. A Wilts Gazette correspondent was told that some of the McGregor Reed's party claimed descent from ancient fire worshippers in India, followers of Zoroastrianism. And Zoroastrianism was the topic upon which McGregor Reed lectured the multitudes after the solstice ceremony. But Antrobus, this time, was determined that his will was not to be defied when McGregor Reed began to recite the prayers of the sun worshippers. All ten universalists, including McGregor Reed, George Catchlove, and two ladies, were forcibly removed by the police. Once outside, McGregor Reed reopened old wounds by declaring the crowd that Antrobus had had no right to enclose the site and demanded his money back. The accounts vary between newspapers, but one version has it that a crowd of about 400 men and youths either urged the Universalists to rush the gate or endeavored to do so themselves, and threatened to pull down the fence until restrained by the police. The Druids seemed to be inactive from 1915 to 1917, but in 1918, McGregor Reed told a large congregation that although as children of God, all were a part of one great faith, Druidism was nonetheless more wholesome than the religions of Canterbury and Rome. Faith in the Druid God will make homes sacred, make houses replace barracks, and make wars cease. The present churches were powerless to stop the war. Another thing happened in 1918 that greatly impacted the Druid movement. Cecil Chubb purchased Stonehenge in an auction by Sir Cosmo Gordon Antrobus soon after he had inherited the estate from his brother. And in 1915, for 6,600 pounds around 563,000 pounds, or $736,000 today. And in October 26, 1918, he gave the Stonehenge to the nation, and the Druids had great hopes that they, at last, could hold their services without being a menace to anyone. 
The Office of Works, however, resolved to retain both the admission charge and Antrobus's for former caretaker, both of which were damned to the Druids. In the following June, someone was apparently writing to the local papers urging that the Druids' rights to celebrate the solstice should be curtailed. At about this time, the Druids began to call themselves this, which I will not be trying to pronounce and will use Adub instead. This meaning the Universal Druid Brotherhood. Adub, an appropriately Gaelic title for a McGregor-led clan, they now wrote to the Welsh Prime Minister Lloyd George, requesting permission to hold their services and hoping that his influence may be extended to the maintenance of peace within our little mecca of Celtic idealism at Stonehenge. And Charles Pierce, the inspector of ancient monuments and responsible for the Stonehenge, agreed to let these curious persons carry on as they did before. As they do no harm to the stones, nor outrage conventional public decency. Now, however, as of right, the power to include or exclude now rested firmly with the civil servants. In that summer of 1919, the caretaker prevented the Druids from holding an extra service on another day. In this, he was supported by peers. They have no claim to be treated as other than ordinary members of the public. The beginnings of structural organization came to Druid universalism at around the time that the order began using their Gaelic name. And in a year-long project from 1919 to 1920, the Office of Works financed a program of selective restoration to their new acquisition. They called in the Society of Antiquaries to appoint an expert antiquary to supervise the operation. The antiquaries, however, had more ambitious plans. The president, Sir Arthur Evans, was nearing the end of his term. He had had, in Chippingdale's words, a frustrating five-year term of office because of the war. The Stonehenge restoration gave him a chance to make his mark with a new outlet for the society's energies. <clears throat> the small excavations required by the office works would only be preliminaries to the grander scheme. An eventual excavation of the whole monument within and including the circular bank and ditch. In 1920, the office works decided that the urgent work had been done and halted their operations. The antiquary's chosen excavator, however, Colonel Hawley, was empowered to continue excavating the site, which he did, usually alone, for the next six years. Chippingdale says frankly that Hawley's years were a disaster. By 1926, half the site had been dug away, and yet the monument remained as mysterious as ever. When the Daily Chronicle reporter came to visit the Brotherhood's temple in 1924, he was quoted saying he saw a model trilithon certainly featured amongst the temple's artifacts, together with a little gilded statue of Buddha. The temple occupied the two large downstairs rooms. The Chronicle journalist found that the one which would ordinarily be used as a dining room contained the trilithon, the other the drawing room, used for ord ordinary services. This room was dominated by the London Shrine, a handsome carved oak table bearing the date of 1643, with the sightings of the zodiac carved upon it. The shrine came to feature quite considerably in Adub hagiography. It was first mentioned in the New Life in 1923. The shrine of the ancient faith is now in our possession. And although in some that word now might imply a relatively recent acquisition, to read, and especially to his followers, its existence somehow served as proof that the order had been in existence since 1643, at least. In 1931, a mystic message was said to have been found in a secret part of the shrine, which had belonged to the Neo-Druids or the Rosicrucian Order, as organized by Roger Bacon and the Druid Lodges of his time. And as we shall see, the tale was further elaborated by Arthur Peacock for the benefit of transatlantic universalists thereafter. The temple functioned as a seminary as well as a wor place of worship. In addition to the three weekly services, two on Sundays, an assortment of weekly classes were held on a wide range of subjects that included politics, economics, psychology, world religions, the occult, mysticism, yogi, and medicine. It was a heady and exciting collage, and McGregor Reed found some true disciples from the back streets of Clapham. 
it seems the most of the Clapham congregation were happy to be Druids for the day. For when some American Universalists tried to visit the Clapham Church around 1930 solstice, they found the doors were locked and were told that the congregation was away to a summer assembly down Stonehenge Way. McGregor was aging, and others began becoming increasingly more important to the order, three in particular, McGregor Reed's son, Robert, Arthur Peacock, and George W. Smith. More on all of them later, though. The first important member in point of time was George Catchlove, a schoolmaster from Deauville Road, a vegetarian food reformer, and a regular enthusiast regarding camp open-air life. He was the church's secretary or corresponding counselor, and in 1913, and died shortly after in 1919, he was succeeded by the shadowy figure of Thomas Ireland, later also minister of the Clapham Church and assistant in McGregor Reed's later ventures. He drops from the record after 1930, but this may have been McGregor himself. In the early days, the hierarchy included a chief arc of intermediate function. Walter Rodway was one, a hammersmith grocer, allegedly initiated in 1918. Although he died not long afterwards, it was his ashes, together with those of George Catchlove, that were at the center of the 1924 burial dispute. His successor was Valentine Haig, linked explicitly with the Barishith Lodge, first mentioned in 1923. Two years later, the title was dropped, and Haig became a simple secretary. At this time, there were female druids, too. Two women were present at the 1914 solstice. A woman was involved in the scuffle at the Stonehenge Turnstile in 1925, and another was found selling the Druid Journal in 1930, but their names were not recorded, sadly. How many Druid Universalists were there in total? In the late 1940s, after the church had been bombed, the basic membership of the Universalist congregation was put at 37, with an extra 100 on the mailing list, these figures tally with the Stonehenge custodians' headcounts. 34 Druids took part in the solstice ceremony in 1928 and 52 the following year, when the Druids were reported as arriving in two motor coaches. An average Druid population seemed around 50 for many years, but they had many sympathizers, and some were notable, such as Pamela Tennant, Lady Glen Connor, thereafter Lady Grey, her death in 1928. Pamela was, a mystic, was mystically inclined, an admirer of the noble teaching of the Universal Church, which she saw as an authentic source of lofty Druidism. She was present at the 1950 sol solstice service and helped the Druids in a practical fashion, not only by allowing them to camp on her land in 1913, but by giving them the right to hold their services at the Double Circle at Normanton Gorse during the various tussles with temporal authority. Since the Druid Universalism did not require its adherents to formally subscribe to anything, it was not necessary to be aware of being a Druid Universalist in order to be one, allegedly. McGregor Reed's own words, where the old ideas were taught it is sufficient for us to say, here lies the ancient message in another guise. This convenient argument not only allowed McGregor Reed to augment the Universalist population at will when asked for statistics by journalists, but also to invoke all the great names of the Socialist canon as founding fathers. The Druid Order were brazenly claimed to have been meeting at the Stone since the days of the Digger Movement, was at different times said to have included Jared Winstonley, John LeBurn, John Ruskin, Charles Dickens, Robert Owen, Tom Paine, Dante Gabriel Rossetti, Walter Crane, William Morris, Pierre Joseph Proudhon, Eliphas Levi, Gerald Macy, the Buddhist Edwin Arnold, the Theosophist Colonel Henry Alcott, and a host of lesser luminaries, as well as writers on Druidry, such as John Aubrey, William Stuckley, William Blake, John Tallinn, Godfrey Higgins, James Relly, generally known as the first formal Universalist, was by Reed described as the Druid who restored the movement and gave it to the name of Universalism. From this list of radical idealists, a list of chosen chiefs was eventually elaborated by McGregor Reed's son, Robert. 
but the only one to achieve that distinction during Reed Sr.'s own lifetime was his immediate predecessor, John Barry O'Callaghan. O'Callaghan was a civil engineer, an Irish loyal to the former Home Rule leader Charles Stuart Parnell, and a close personal friend of McGregor. On his death in 1909, Reed published a four-page blackboarded obituary in the Nature Cure. He was a simplicitarian, an anti-vivisectionist, and a one-time Roman Catholic who ended his days as an unabridged universalist. But what seemed to have impressed McGregor Reed the most about his friend's career was his role as a social reformer, who was the founder of the Equitable Governed State, president of the Rational Reform League, and the originator of the most equitable system of taxation yet evolved. At first sight, this might seem to be a somewhat curious credential for a later-day Druid chieftain, but to McGregor Reed, fiscal reform was inseparable from more esoteric matters. Political economy is the application of morals to business. Eliminate the moral en element, and political economy becomes the science of dust and ashes, all the heart of affairs scorched out of them. In the new life, space was found to print lengthy book reviews and articles about the nature of the body e economy and its relationship to the higher things. Religious advancement must go hand in hand with economic advancement. The one cannot be separated from the other. The huge and equal emphasis that McGregor Reed thus placed on social and spiritual reform were the qualities that distinguish not just the universalist of old, but could also be used to identify positive movements in the world today. This is why he supported the Azali Babis, the Senussi, and for a few brief years the British Labour Party too. Towards the end of the Great War, McGregor Reed began regularly preaching socialism on Clapham Common. Apparently under the banner of the Commonwealth and Free State League, huge crowds came to hear him, summoned from a bright red Damler, in which he toured the streets, banging a huge dinner gong. Meanwhile, the universal bond continued to draw the crowds to Stonehenge. In addition to the dawn ritual inside the stones, their evening services at the Double Circle attracted people in surprising numbers. 1,000 in 1928, 2,000 in 1929, and 1930. In 1930, a retired army major wrote to the Office of Works essentially to inform on McGregor Reed, whom he claimed was still inciting visitors to tear down the fences amongst other things. He spoke against the church and religion and upheld the Soviet government. His general speaking was communistic and anti-government. Although one or two present argued with him, there were others who shook him by the hand as evidence of their appreciation of what he said. The Office of Works did not take any action over this part of the Major's allegations, but they were concerned over his claim that certain pamphlets were being sold within the Stonehenge by a girl and a man who were evidently his associates. The pamphlet in question was The New Life, now revamped as The New Life and Drew a Journal, and sporting a rather stylish arts and craftsy trilithon on the front cover. Inquiries were du duly made of the new custodian who reported that there was nothing to take exception to in it. Further complaints were received the next year from local residents, however perhaps involved in the protest Christian service that was held at this solstice. Sensing trouble, Arthur Peacock, editor of the journal, sent a courteous letter to the Office of Works asking for formal permission to sell the journal as they had been doing. He was refused, none but official publications being sold at the ancient monuments in the c custody is what was told to him. But the Druids felt strongly that the official guidebook was biased against them. It is only just and fair that if Mr. Stevens' book, which gives the anti-Druid view, is on sale at the turnstile, then on the day of our service at least copies of the Druid journal might be placed with the caretaker and made available to any inquirers who might wish to have them, wrote Peacock. To read, this was the last straw. Not only had they been forced to beg from an authority of the earth to worship at their own temple, but the ideas contained in the book to Stonehenge issued by the government brought shame to every man and woman who understand aught about this question. 
This was the last solstice they'd hold at Stonehenge. He declared and announced plans to build a new temple at the Double Circle, a scheme for which, he claimed, he had already raised 4,000 pounds. This utterance was designed to upset everyone, particularly in view of the contemporary National Trust campaign, to have all visible buildings in the Stonehenge landscape removed, saying, to erect within sight of genuine Stonehenge is a proposition of atrociously bad taste. No more was heard of the scheme, but the universal bond duly stayed away from the stones for the rest of the decade, as if to compensate the AOD and other druidical groups held ceremonies regularly at other times of the summer, but too many. The druids had become synonymous with the Stonehenge solstice, and at least one observer attributed the steady decline to the number of people attending the solstice during the 1930s, in part at least to the druids' non-attendance. McGregor Reed's Druid druidic mantle was inherited by George W. Smith, who was as proud as Peacock to proclaim his debt to Reed saying, He was the most remarkable man I have ever met. He was very learned, and I am only too proud to say he taught me all I know, both of the Druid movement and of the Socialist movement. Smith first came across McGregor Reed when he came out of the army in 1919. He promptly joined the Clapham Labor Party and served as the executive as secretary of the South Ward until 1930. He was thus not only a near contemporary of Peacock, but perhaps his mirror image, other than that he clearly relished Reed's mystical side, while Peacock was uncomfortable with it. As some date before 1938, Smith became the general secretary of the ancient order of Druid Hermeticists. According to Ithel Calcun, the AODH was a descendant of the Irish branch of the Hermetic Society, founded by one-time Golden Dawn member George Russell in Dumbled subsequently led by P.G. Bowen, Bowen's own disciple and editor, Miss E.A. Ansel, went to London in 1926 and continued his teaching under the title of the Ancient Order of Druid Hermeticists, which was amalgamated with A.W. 20 years later. In 1938, Smith wrote to the Office of Works requesting permission to celebrate at Stonehenge and also played a major part in producing the Order's journal called The Pendragon, the first issue of which appeared at Midsummer, 1938. The timing suggests that it was designed for the distribution at Stonehenge, like the Druid Journal before it, and the following year when he applied for permission on behalf of the AODH's Grand Council. The letterhead bore the same winged sun symbol that McGregor Reed had used for the new life 25 years earlier. Here, however, the similarities begin to fade, for the simple reason that Smith, perhaps faced with the indifference or disinterest of McGregor, had found another elder, elderly, eccentric guru for the cause. This was William George Hooper, who at one time had been considered a physicist of note. His Aether and Gravitation, published in 1903, won him a fellowship of the Royal Astronomical Society. Hooper had been a practicing Christian, a volunteer of the YMCA, and an active member of the Brotherhood Movement, a sort of working-class equivalent to the Rotary Club. Shocked by what he had saw in France during the Great War, he vowed thereafter to work, teach, and live for the peace and fellowship based on eternal and cosmic principles of divine wisdom and divine love. In 1920, he joined the Brotherhood of Healers, a Christian-based faced healing network founded by the eccentric brother, James Macbeth Bain, hymn writer and barefoot advocate, and established a New Age center in Highcliffe on Senior Bournemouth, a well-heeled strip of southern England that became something of a center for occult and mystical activity between the wars. Hooper's worldview was central to the AODH. It was apparent that he had contributed much to the material and possibly of its ideas to be found in the first edition of the Pendragon, and also from what can be gleaned from Ithil Kalkun's paraphrasing in later editions too. At the age of 81, he was elected president of the festival for the 1946 Stonehenge Solstice, and after his death, Smith presided over a solemn service at the Stones in 1948. Smith's Stonehenge speeches reported in the local press as reliably as Reed's had been, 
an interesting fusion of Hooper and Reed, celebrating the rights of Cavaron at the double, double circle in 1943 to an audience of over 200. He claimed that the Druid's inspiration passing from out the deepest antiquity causes the Druid to de dedicate his power to the unseen, to the spirit of beauty, of wisdom, and of universal love. Thus inspired, the Druid seems the coming of a new age, when men will have lost the terrible prerogative we have so long used for cruelty and wrong towards those who are weaker than himself. The 1943 service was not held at the Stones themselves because Smith's party had apparently once more declined to pay the Office of Works entry fee. In 1926, he requested and was granted permission to use the Stones for what was described as the Festival of the Summer Solstice, and the following year arranged to hold a memorial service to read on the afternoon of June 22nd, at which the BBC was present. He was making changes, seeking to open the organization up, endeavoring to underpin the Druid's cause with the symptoms of a more conventional organization. New lodge name appeared, and the 1948 solstice, he announced that the combined order intends to embark on a widespread teaching of pure Druid science and philosophy throughout the British Isles. George Smith clearly had the blessings of George McGregor Reed in in his endeavors. He had both the letterhead and the seal as he told the office works. He and Peacock, between them, had inherited McGregor Reed's mission. Unfortunately, his son Robert, who was none too impressed with the way things had turned out, his father's faithful and devoted father, father for much of his life. At some point they fell out, perhaps when his father remarried. Robert apparently sought Peacock's job as minister in 1937, but in his father's eyes took his rejection badly. Poor boy, he knows all but acts like one who knows little, wrote Reed Sr. to his friend Will Bromley of Detroit in 1942. He could not do the work of Mr. Peacock and had no reason to be jealous of his election. Relations between father and son continued to deteriorate and in October 1945, McGregor Reed Sr. made a new will, in which he not only left all of his papers and books to my successor in ministry of the Universalist Church, Arthur Peacock, but left everything else to his new wife. Robert was left with nothing. He may have tried to repossess the altar from Peacock, since years later he told Ethel Calcun that it was in the possession of a un unitarian minister unwilling to surrender it. But he never acquired it. He didn't even have the right to call himself chosen chief, although Smith was careful to call himself secretary. The title of chief was bestowed upon him by McGregor Reed Sr. because uh, he considered his son to lack both philosophic depth and leadership. It seems that some of his father's former druids considered that he had been hard done by. Robert had obviously taken part in the AODH activities since in 1947 he resigned from it, in which he took several members with him. Some close to Robert later said that he had been given a mandate to carry on the Druid Order by one Harry Chadwick, the last existent member of McGregor Reed's Universal Bond Council, and a meeting was duly held at Leamington in November of 1949 which confirmed Robert McGregor Reed as chosen chief. Smith and his party refused to acknowledge the coup, and for several years after thereafter, two groups of Druids, both claiming the legitimacy bestowed by George Watson, presented, were petitioning the Office of Works for the right to hold the dawn service at the Stonehenge Solstice. In 1943, officials of the Office of Works debated the issue, and in the end, they found the older group by which they meant the one led by the well-known name of McGregor Reed, this being his son's order. And this is where our story will end today. Both groups continue to evolve to this day. Thank you for watching today's video, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. Let me know what topic you would like me to do next, and it may be my next video.